In this video, we're going to consider the energy balance of crack propagation and how we arrive at the fracture toughness as a material's property. This thermodynamic argument for the energy balance of crack propagation is attributed to Griffith and is usually known as the Griffith criterion. And in this case, we have this thermodynamic energy balance between two competing energies which arise during crack propagation. So the two energy terms are that first, when the crack propagates, elastic energy is released in a volume of material, but when that crack propagates, we also have two new surfaces being created. The crack will propagate in the case when the elastic strain energy released is greater than the surface energy it takes to create those two new surfaces. Let's take a look at these two different contributions more closely. Let's assume then that we have a, a thin plate actually and our thin plate has a crack in it and as usual we will call the length of that crack 2a. We're going to call the thickness of our plate T and assuming that our plate is thin enough, then this is going to be loaded in plane stress. So no stress in the x3 direction. So the first term in our energy balance was about the elastic strain energy. So if we assume that really this, this crack is sort of traces out an ellipse here and the relaxed volume is essentially sort of an ellipsoid and this has a width still of 2a and in this direction a dimension of 4a and so this is representing the relaxed volume when a stress is applied to this material. So we have an applied stress and this is the relaxed volume because there's no stress carried right on that crack. Then as the crack grows, we sort of go from, from this size and this is through the plane. This, this is sort of a planar drawing, right? And so that ellipse of relaxed volume also grows. And so this little amount here would be dA the amount by which the crack grows. So we see that the volume goes up as the crack length goes up as well. We know from before that the elastic energy per unit volume is equal to sigma squared divided by 2e, where sigma is the applied stress and e is the Young's modulus. So if we want to know the total strain energy released, we multiply the energy per unit volume by the volume. In this case, the volume is equal to the area of the ellipse times the thickness, and the area of the ellipse is just pi times 2a times a, and the thickness is t, and so the volume is equal to 2 pi a squared times t, and so we can then come up with an expression for the total strain energy released. So the total strain energy released is equal to pi times sigma squared a squared t divided by e, where sigma is the applied stress, a is our half crack length, t is the thickness, and e is the Young's modulus. If we are assuming plane stress, then we can do this per unit thickness. In which case, the total strain energy released is given just by this equation here, pi sigma squared a squared divided by e. So we've norma normalized essentially by the thickness. So this is the first energy term that we looked at. That's the elastic energy released in the volume. 
that is compensated in the growth of a new crack by the creation of two new surfaces. So we now need to consider what the surface energy is in creating these two new surfaces. We're going to do this using gamma sub s, which is the surface energy, and it is the energy per unit area of the surface. The area of the crack is 2 times a times t, but we have two surfaces. And so in total, the surface energy that is generated, the surface energy of the crack rather, is equal to 4 times a times t times gamma s. And again, if we do this per unit thickness, then we instead get 4 a gamma s. We are interested then in assessing that energy balance. So we need to consider the change in potential energy of a plate with an elliptical crack. And we are going to call this delta u. Delta u is given by this difference in the energy of the material with the crack in it as compared to the energy of the material without the crack. And this is simply given by this equation here where it, delta U is the increase in surface energy that arises from adding the crack minus the elastic strain energy released. So one thing to point out, this is not a, this is not a one for one. This isn't this and this isn't this. Just in general, that change is the surface energy that's created minus the elastic energy which is released. So let's take a look at what happens then when the crack grows by a small amount dA. When the crack grows by a small amount dA, this is good in some ways because elastic energy is released. On the other hand, new surfaces are created though, thus increasing the energy of the system. The crack is thus stable when these two terms balance one another out. The system will be in equilibrium then when du dA is equal to zero, when the change in that potential energy with crack growth is equal to zero. Because we had an expression for delta U in terms of A, we can take the derivative and then have an expression here for du dA, and that's just four gamma S, where this is that surface energy, minus 2 pi sigma squared a divided by e, the Young's modulus, and we set this equal to 0. And we can then rearrange and figure out what is that stable crack length. When we set it equal to 0 and rearrange, we end up with this expression. So this is the balance between the surface energy term and the elastic strain energy term. If what we want to know is the critical stress needed for a crack to propagate, we can then solve for sigma. We find this expression here for the critical stress, and it is in terms of these material properties. So it's in terms of the Young's modulus and the surface energy, but also depends on the current crack length. Now, it's important that we note that this is for plane stress. So that's where the plate is thick and there's not stress in the x3 direction. We have a slightly modified equation in the case of plane strain. Here's the equation for the case of plane strain, which would be a thicker plate, and it's modified by this term here. And this is 1 minus nu, and actually this should say squared, 1 minus nu squared, that's the Poisson's ratio, and this is due to confinement in the direction of the thickness. By looking at these equations, we can also get a sense about the importance of the crack length. If we compare these two terms essentially, so the negative of the change in the elastic energy with respect to crack length, when that is greater than or equal to the change in the uh, surface 
energy. So this gamma is sort of our surface area term. So the, the energy created by the surfaces compared to the crack length, that's when the crack will propagate. If we look again then at the expression for that critical stress, we see that the critical stress is proportional to 1 over the square root of A, the crack length. So if we bring that uh, square root of A to the other side, then that depends only on material constants. So the right side here, this is the Young's modulus and surface energy just divided by pi. So the right side here, these are all material constants. So this term here, the critical stress times the crack length depends on these material constants. And in fact, this is what we define as the fracture toughness. So this is the fracture toughness. That's a materials property, and it tells us essentially for any value of A what that critical stress will be, and this gets the subscript K1C. The 1 is indicating that it's in mode 1 loading, and the C is indicating that that's the critical value at which that crack will propagate. So in summary, by considering the energy balance of crack growth, which has two contributions, the elastic strain energy and the surface energy, we were able to determine the critical stress at which a crack will propagate and to determine our materials property of fracture toughness, which for any given crack length will give us that stress value.